Um, we'll be doing something around the Data and Analytics Summit later this year, and we're also engaging with IDSC around standardizing some student success dashboards through PowerHeader. And I've added that over there because the Gender Gap work group um, has been discussed a couple of times with our partners, but it seems like we need to really do something about it in terms of establishing a work group or a work stream. So that's the work streams, and I'm now going to speak a little bit about the service workshops. So previously, and some of the questions that was asked was around what are we doing to share the best practices that has been happening in some of our partner institutions, and that's really what the service workshops are all about. They were originally planned to be face-to-face, -face, but then COVID happened and we had to pivot, and we moved them onto the online environment. And I think that was actually a blessing because we saw that the number of workshops that were able to be delivered increased dramatically, as well as the attendance. People were just able to join into the Zoom sessions. There was no longer having to fly up, organize venues, pay for accommodation, pay for food, pay for catering. Instead, we had it all online and we were able to do so much more with less money. So how did we come about structuring these service workshops? And I wanted to present this to you from Sia Pumalela 1, The Theory of Change. And it's around the outcomes in terms of knowing, doing, and being. And this has kind of developed into the theory of change that we're using for our service workshops. A change in what we know, a change in what we do, and a change in who we are, a change and transforming our institutions. So this is a theory of change that we've been using for our service workshops. We then try to structure it, so really a change in knowing, a change in doing, and a change in being results in student success. Very simplistic. <laughs> but how do we actually go about it? Where do we focus our areas? So we landed up looking at all of the service workshops that have been presented by the institutions and we started to figure out how we can group these. We pulled on a whole lot of different resources, we looked at ICAT, we looked at what Achieving the Dream does, and we eventually clustered it into these three areas of supporting students, the use of data for student success, and transforming our institutions. And you would see in the conference program as well that we've actually used these learning pathways to structure the presentations for the conference. And lastly, to add to it, so we've got our knowing, doing, transforming, we've got our learning pathways, and then we had a look at the levels that these workshops were offered at. Was it at the foundational phase, the basic phase? Was it at the intermediate phase? Or was it at the advanced stage? <coughs> so that generated a whole lot of information. And don't look, pay attention to this in too much detail because I'll take you through it individually. But it's quite interesting to see that at the top we've got our supporting students and those are the workshops that were offered in 2021 and 2022. We've got a whole lot of workshops around the use of data for supporting students and then we've got a few workshops around transforming institutions. And it's interesting to see how this is translated to the conference where we've got three parallel sessions on supporting students one on the use of data to support students and four presentations on transforming institutions. So if we're looking at gaps and things where we, where we can improve in the future, for me it's definitely around the transforming institutions, the workshops that get offered over there. And then all of the workshops that we're doing around the use of data needs to be transformed, no, needs to be applied. And we need to be seeing those presentations and the best practices coming through from the institutions. So if we have a look at this in a bit more detail, the supporting students, there's a lot of work that was done around the holistic student support, the supplemental instruction comes in over there, your open textbooks, and that's the change in what we know. And then it's to the change in what we do, and lastly, the transforming, you can see not much over there. So again, an opportunity is around focusing some of our future workshops around a change in what we do. 
I think we know most of us are doing, but are we really transforming? When it comes to the use of data, again, lots around what we know, lots around what we do, not so much around how we actually transform in our institutions. And when it comes to the transforming institutions, there you can see it's all around what we know, very little around what we do, and nothing in terms of the transforming. So that's just something to think about in terms of, for the partners, when it comes to offering the service workshops in the future, and in the next phase, where should we be focusing some of the service workshops? Here are some of the evaluation comments around it. It was quite interesting in yesterday's session around data. Somebody was asking, how do we get students to actually complete their survey forms? I would like to ask you the same thing. How do we get you to complete your evaluations of the workshops? You'll also be having the evaluation of the conference. Please complete it. One of the things we said is if students see that their data is being used and we're closing the feedback loop, they'll see the importance of it. Please see the importance of your data, your evaluation. We are trying to close the feedback loop. Our response rates here are very, very low all around, but the data is really useful, really insightful. It goes back to the partners, the people who host the service workshops, so that they can improve it moving forward. Okay, so please, complete your evaluation forms, since I've got the pulpit, I'm going to uh, preach for a little bit. Complete the evaluation forms for the service workshops, complete the evaluation forms for the conference, that will be sent out later today or tomorrow, and we will use that evidence to show how we're going to improve our conferences and our workshops moving forward. Thank you. Good afternoon. Let me repeat that a bit. Good afternoon. <laughs> that sounds better and very heartwarming. Thank you. Um, so, I am Laysa Matriko, and one of the roles that I play within SAID is to coordinate the national service workshops across all the institutions that are offered in there. And one of the in fact, to ensure that these service workshops are effectively and efficiently implemented, we have adopted a four-stage four approach between SAID staff and the institutions that are offering the Sacramento National Service Workshops. That consists of the planning, i.e. making sure that the services that are being offered are aligned with the Sacramento goals. Secondly, um, is the logistic coordination, which also in, comes from the MOA um, that the partner institutions will be very familiar with. And coming to the slide that you're looking at currently, is the convening of the actual national service workshop. And there's actually a lot of work that takes place before those service workshops that you, you see. One of that is the interaction between safety staff and the facilitators, the institutional leads, so that we give clarity in terms of expectations. We also assess the readiness of the institution that we offer in the workshop. Last one, the confirmation of the resource requirements. Now, last year we had about 11, in fact 13 service workshops that we offered. Out of that 13, 11 were online and two were in person, face to face. About 18 institutions attended those workshops. Out of that, we have counted about 27 people that attended. On average, you are looking at about 26 people per workshop. If you want to zoom into the institutions that were part in terms of the partner institutions and the participants and associate institutions, you'll note that about eight out of the 13 were partner institutions, that eight workshops were attended by the partner institutions, and uh, five were attended by the participants and associates. We thought that we have done pretty well for 2022. Little did we know 
what is coming for 2023. Amen. Raise yourselves. <laughs> up to date from January up until now, I, that is June, we have about eight workshops that have been offered by the institution. So you can count the difference considering that we are mid, mid year currently. And I'd like to submit to you that as from July up until end of November, we are expecting 11 national service workshops that will be offered. You will see those in my next slide. That, that speaks volumes about the value of the service workshops that have been offered. And hence, on this slide, you are seeing that there has been an increase in terms of the number of people who are attending. Up to date, 251 people have attended. On average, you can pick up from the previous slide that the average attendance has increased from 26 to about 31 people per workshop. And even if you look at, the, at who is coming for the service workshops, I mean, it's even the balance between the partner institutions and the participants and associates, i.e., all these universities are seeing the value in terms of attending those national service workshops. As I said, that you should fasten your seatbelts. You, you, you will note on this slide that um, I'm not going to go into detail in terms of each and every workshop. But as early as the 26th of July, we have a service workshop on the gateway to success. I'm mentioning this because Kathleen Thomas, the student from West University, on her presentation, she mentioned this as one of um, the activities that she was part of that contributed to her success. So it will be interesting um, to see what that consists of from West University when they present it. And I'm just going to touch one more on that. There's also the mental health work stream, um, which we'll be providing a service workshop. You'll have picked up from Ashley's presentation that mental health was among the web streams. Now, after they've had quite a number of discussions, engagement around the issues of mental health across institutions in South Africa, they have been able to reach a stage to say, we are now ready to offer a national service workshop to all institutions. I think that does deserve a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. It's those national service workshops, about 11 of them, and two of those will be face to face. On the 1st of September, there's one that will be in UCT, and another one um, will be at UFS. I think it's about three days, if I'm not mistaken. But we will be communicating with the institutional leads. I've started that already during the course of the week. For those that we woke up with emails, you might have picked that up. So we are looking forward to the rest of the service workshop that will be offered. This is not a complete list because there are those who said, well, so wait a bit. We do want to offer a service workshop, but the date will follow on later on. Lastly, it's very important to pick up from this slide that in terms of the learning pathways that Ashton was speaking on, you are having about five national service workshops that will be offered that are all about supporting, supporting and supporting students. That speaks volumes about the importance of giving support in institutions. Secondly, you pick up on transforming institutions. You've got about four service workshops that will be covering the learning pathway on transforming institutions. And you have about two that are looking at use of data for student success. And I'd like to submit to you that it's not an indicator of the lack of importance of using data. But you might have picked up in the number of conversations that we have across institutions that institutions 
do want to use data to inform their decision making. However, there is limited capacity across institutions. If you zoom in and see who is offering those service workshops, you will realize that we do have a challenge in terms of capacity when it comes to um, who is well trained, who is more familiar with use of data and who is willing also to offer that in our national service workshops. Thank you very much.
had a higher probability of passing more than 70% of their modules. Now this was starting to look promising for us. We looked at this and this was irrelevant of APS score, really looking at if someone came and sat with someone to talk about whether psychosocial, being referred to a support service, they were in front of an academic advisor, what did that moment or that meeting mean to them? This was the evidence in 2017. What we did now is we dug into the student engagement indicators and we really wanted to understand, looking at advising and the student engagement in, in indicators and the students that participated in this, in this space, what did this mean? The data continued to confirm what the Creating Pathways report revealed. You can see on the screen here, in blue, the students that did not participate in advising, and in red, the students that participate in advising. And this is comparatively looking at national, uh, their national cohort, and uh, this is where you see that the students, for instance, with indicators like collaborative learning, students that participated in advising had about a 40, a 40 mean score average in terms, as compared to 36 for those that did not participate in advising. So some could say maybe they were prompted by the advisor to really participate in some of these student engagement opportunities created in the system. So what we were seeing is advising was starting to touch base with the, the relevant uh, activities that meant uh, the most for students when it comes to student success. 2018, this image looks very familiar for many of us. The ministerial statement is released. We receive the ministerial statement and what do we see on the screen? Student advising. For the first time in the higher education sector, student advising is pronounced as an intentional pillar or lever that enables student success. What does this mean for us as practitioners, scholars? There was a future for advising. Parallel to this, call, to this ministerial statement was a call to action. We were called to settle the philo philosophical debate. We were called to accept responsibility for what we as universities can do, what we can do to be student ready. There was focus, we were called to action to focus more on what we can control and that, was, that meant we needed to look more into our data and our support interventions that we were rendering. We were called to maximize the use of existing resources. I need not say, we've heard from all the presentations, the call to integration, the call to collaboration, and not competition. We were also called to use data to develop strategy, and we were also called to change, to support success, student success, and this is the very community that started that for us. Between 2007 and 2008, the Siapumilela Academic Advising Workstream started developing. We were a very small community and I remember us gathered to discuss what does advising mean for you in your context. And these are the institutions and the, the key founders in, in advising at the time that participated in this. We really looked at where does advising exist in your institution? Does it exist in the student orientation program? Does it exist in your first year experience program? Does it exist in your first year seminar program? Or even in your mentorship and tutorial programs? Well, needless to say, we all came up to a consensus that there was a form of advising taking place in all our different institutions in different forms, but we came to a consensus that advising is an intentional and ongoing teaching and learning practice. And I think this meant a lot for us as a sector, as a community, because we started unpacking and understanding advising for the South African context. We all came to a conclusion that the purpose of advising is really to empower students, to help them align not just their academic aspirations, but to look at their personal, their academic and their career goals and bringing that into one conversation that can, in essence, channel them through to being employable graduates. We looked at facilitating a conceptual understanding, sharing of relevant information, and building a relationship. But most importantly, having a meaningful academic experience and having that sense of belonging. In 2008, we submitted then, or we were awarded, the collaborative grant by the Department of Higher Education and Training to really start looking at the work of advising. 
seven institutions form part of this collaborative grant, and we were committed to really realizing the deliverables you see on the screen, really expanding the dedicated advising capacity, baseline, having baseline in investigations at our various institutions, enabling collaboration, having national sharing, and establishing communities of practice in our space. We concluded this grant in, 2000, in 2021, sorry, and we then got awarded a second round of the DHEAD grant, and in this instance, there were 14 institutions as opposed to the original seven. Again, we re-looked at the deliverables and continued to work on improving the deliverables we were committed to in the first DHEAD grant. Again, we were looking at the appointment of an ex expansion of dedicated advising capacity, training and development, in enhanced data-driven uh, practice, pilot, uh, pilot and share advising practices, national and international sharing, and then the establishment of an advising community um, to enable success. To show where we are, we've since become allied members of the National Academic Advising Association, which is the global community for academic advising, known as NACADA, and we have adapted and adopted their framework that talks to advisor competencies. And in the circle there, you see the five units or components that make up the short learning program that has been developed in collaboration with Georgia State University to advance the professionalization of academic advisors in the South African higher education sector. This data you saw, you saw just now on Prostratum's presentation, but I want you to focus on the two lines. You would notice that we had um, the program start in 2018, and to date we have had those number of participants. But what's interesting is participants versus certified advisors is sitting at 83%. So 83% of the participants that have come to our advising short learning program have been certified. And I'm glad to see many of them sitting in this room this afternoon with us. In terms of the... In terms of the reflections of the, the participants in the short learning program, I've just taken five of the quotes. And you can see here that the, advisor, the advisors or the professionals that have participated in the short learning program have really encountered this as a meaningful experience that has enabled them or even professionalized or enhanced their practices at their various institutions. The, first, the third one says, I realized how important my role is in a student's lives. And I think that meaning-making process for you as a professional uh, translates into how you then render your service to students. This is our community in 2023. You can see we are now covering 18 of the 26 universities where we started with only six. And this is really looking promising in the landscape of the higher education scholarly practice but also community of practice and I really want to implore that if your institution is not part of this community come on board this is the best community to exist in you've heard the conversations and you should be part of the conversations and continue forming part of that looking beyond 2023 we are looking at building onto the short learning program and developing pathways and what the pathways will then enable is enable professionals to specialize their advising practices. So no longer just the generic advisor, now you're becoming an advisor with specialized components looking at data analytics, looking at leadership and management, looking at assessment of advising, looking at ethical standards, looking at career and, and career development and curriculum advising practices. And this will continue the collaborations between different institutions because many of the institutions have started tapping into various components indicated on these pathways. So I look forward to those that have not participated in the short learning program to seeing you between the 9th and the 12th of October in Johannesburg when we present the short learning program. And for those that have already participated in the short learning program, you can look forward to being part of these pathways as co-contributors but also participants. And again, I just want to thank you for being part of this community. Thank you. Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, I am here to 
it only about supplemental instruction and the take for supplemental instruction is different than it is for academic advising in the sense that academic advising is something that grew from Siapa Malela where SI is something that we brought into Siapa Malela and to utilize the Siapa Malela network and to try and bring different national streams together. So I'm going to start by sharing with you um, just the international definition of supplemental instruction for those of you who may not have heard about supplemental instruction before. Supplemental instruction is a non-remedial approach, um, an approach to learning that supports students towards academic success by integrating what to learn yeah. with how to learn. So it's not just about the course content, but how do you tackle that course content? Often if you ask a student, what is it that you're struggling with in this particular course? You'd be surprised how seldom they're going to focus on a specific content issue as sometimes it's about, I don't know how to study for the course or I don't know how to do the practicals for the course. And so it integrates the two. It consists of regularly scheduled, voluntary, out-of-class study sessions driven by student needs. I often get asked the question, how does SI differ to tutorials? Nobody sets a tutorial assignment or a small work assignment for SI that students have to complete in the session. The entire agenda of what happens in the SI session is compiled by the students. What would you like to do today? What would you like to spend time on? This is a space where the student voice can be heard, where the students can say, this is what I'm struggling with. And if what they are struggling with is academic content, then that is what will be covered in the session. If what they are struggling with is keeping up with their note-taking during class, then that is what will be discussed in the session. It is entirely based on their needs. It's one of the few spaces we have where the student has full control of what's happening in that learning space. The sessions are facilitated by trained peer leaders who utilize collaborative activities to ensure peer-to-peer -peer interaction in small groups. And it's implemented in high-risk courses in consultation with the academic staff, and it is supported and evaluated by a trained SI coordinator. I am briefly just going to put it in context for you so that you can understand, so why, do, why are we talking about an SI national office and how, how does that work? So in the early 1960s in America, there was a small private institution that was told that they need to become part of the public university of Missouri system. So they went from a private institution to part of a public institution and told to reach out to the urban centers and with that came changes. And those changes were that they no longer drew the top 20% of high school graduates. That was no longer who they were allowed to target for their student body. They become culturally and academically diverse. And the attrition rate rose from 20% to 50, 20% to 45%, only getting about 55% of their students through the system. Now, if you look at those challenges that they were facing, you will start seeing some similar patterns to what we've experienced in South Africa in the early 1990s, um, similar changes. And that is how um, they then went about it. So about 10 years later, 1972, um, if we think things move slowly here, it sometimes moves slowly in other places as well. So 1972, 10 years later, they were still experiencing the same challenges. And it, then Dr. Diana Martin did a survey at the institution to find out what the perceptions were of, of academic support. She did a lot of research into, amongst others, behavioral learning theory, cognitive development theory, cooperative learning. And out of that was born the supplemental instruction program that was implemented in 1973. It is 50 years old this year internationally. And it, um, from 1993 onwards, it started expanding internationally and thereby they became the SI International Center. There are four national centers around the world. You can see them here on the screen. And um, how did it then come to us in, in South Africa? I'm doing what Charles did. I'm paging you instead of the screen. I apologize. Um, so how did it come to us in South Africa? 
1993, when our university was busy with its transformation planning, we realized that we have a problem. Our academic development programs that we had in place were not geared towards the diversity of students that we were going to get into our institutions. And that is when we heard about the supplemental instruction program. And if you recall the challenges that they were facing internationally, you will see that there were similar challenges that we were facing. What really appealed to us about the SI program is that it labels courses, not students. We didn't want an academic support program in a transformation space that would just keep labeling people. Um, it's one of the biggest mistakes we made in our country up until that point, and we didn't want to perpetuate the problem. And that is something that really appealed to us about SI, that it could be a vehicle for transformation and catalyst for change in the student support um, space. This year we are celebrating 30 years of SI in South Africa. So what are our duties as the SI National Office? Who are we and why are we in this space? We offer SI supervisor training and SI advanced supervisor training that comes with an internationally recognized certificate. So anywhere in the world you go, if you have a certificate from our national center, it will be recognized and it will be accepted. But we also offer audits, reviews, presentations, workshops. We offer a biannual SI national conference. We assist institutions with troubleshooting and networking. Many of the institutions in this space will know that we often would say to people, you need to talk to so-and-so. I just did it this morning for Danae, that's why she's smiling at me. Um, and from about 2018 onwards, we've become a little bit more deliberate about trying to connect SI to existing networks and existing spaces. And that comes from Siapo Malela, where Siapo Malela has been saying, we need to start breaking down the silos, we need to start collaborating more. And it made sense for us, therefore, if we already have a national network of people who've been through SI training, who's either offering SI or adapted forms of SI in their institutions, many of them sitting in this room here that have SI programs or adapted SI programs, um, it makes sense for us to start bringing that into the space and also as a way of paying it forward and to say thank you for the space that Siobhan Malela has created for us and for the things that Siobhan Malela has done for our institution. And so we offer on average two offerings a year to this space. I'm going to get quite blunt in some of this, if you will um, forgive me, but it's a way to understand. For us, the rationale was that it's a lot of institutions have professional development budget constraints. Um, if you think of how many staff members you have and how many of them you can afford to send to training workshops and conferences and the budgets that go with that, there's always somebody in a queue somewhere that has to wait their turn. And this just seemed like a space where we can maybe create more opportunities and where we can open access a bit more for people to attend. Um, it is a nice way for those of us who work in peer learning circles to use these training opportunities and discussion opportunities as a benchmarking exercise. Sometimes people come to SI training only to walk away feeling, we're not doing badly, we're actually doing a great job at our institution already in what we're doing. And if you look at the delegate profile, that is what I have been enjoying most. The people in the Siapa Manila space are so passionate about what they do. And that translates into the service workshops. You literally have people passionate about peer learning, spending some time together in the workshop, throwing around ideas and, and sharing. And that is an incredibly powerful space to be in. And then for those people who think we're only connected to the network to try and get money out of it, um, I thought I'll, I'll, I'll just not, not just demystifying SI but also demystifying the finances, I thought I'll put it in budget for you. A SI supervisor training registration fee for an individual is three and a half thousand rands, which is a quarter of what you pay internationally. They charge now up to $425 internationally for the same training. We can't do that in South Africa. It's just not realistic. So we've tried to keep it affordable, but it's still a substantial amount of money. So if each of the 21, uh, sorry, each of the 17 universities part of Siakomlela sends one delegate 
at three and a half thousand rands, that would have been 59,500. Now it just costs the Siabo Mlela network 15,000 rands and we can get a delegate from each institution into our training. So it's an affordable way to send, because for institutions it's free, that 15,000 comes out of our workshop budget for our Siabo Mlela grant and therefore we we, we're sort of absorbing the cost and we're creating 20, we're creating 17 spaces for people for free, for those people who are maybe in the queue haven't had an opportunity. And it helps us as well to get more institutions involved in discussing SI. And then our university has gained so much from Sia Kamalela. Things that, like the academic advising, uh, our student success coaching comes from the academic advising that happens in Sia Kamalela. Um, I've been watching Flamella, our student coordinator of the Quintal 1 to 3 mentoring program. He's been nodding his head off during most of the presentations today. Um, and one of the things that came from our Seattle Malena is our Quintal 1 to 3 mentoring program and the feedback we've received. If it wasn't for Seattle Malena, we wouldn't have had that program. We wouldn't have known about the language challenges that those students really face. We think we have all the support in place, but then the students say, but we didn't even know what you were doing. We couldn't understand. I believe Clumelo said to us in his first involvement program, you had all the support, but I couldn't understand. My English wasn't good enough to understand what it is that you offer. And so what we've done from his feedback that is a direct benefit for us from the Siapo Malela program that sponsored that, from Siapo Malela that sponsored that program, is we now have translations of our SI marketing document in all 11 South African languages. It was a student project, a voluntary student project. It's available on our SI website. Anyone can go and download it. And furthermore, in our institution, is a direct feedback of something that Siapum Lena gave us. We now also have translations of our learning development services posters in all 11 South African languages available for download on our website. And these are just some of I, I can go on and on about the gains that our institution have gained from being part of this very supportive network and from the funding that we receive so graciously from Kreski. And so if that means that we offer one, maybe two workshops a year to this network at a much more affordable rate, some free spaces for people, it's a very small way of saying thank you for what this network has given to us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to our speakers, particularly to Gugu and Liesel, and of course to my colleagues from SEBI as well. Um, we won't take questions now because we have been running a little bit late and it's lunchtime. I'm sure everybody's wanting to stretch and get into the fresh air and eat something. But I'd just like to end by thanking all the partner institutions and associate institution for the service workshops that they offer and for the sharing of uh, good practice and successful interventions and opening up uh, discussion around all these areas uh, as part of their contribution to the CFO Network. Thank you very much and enjoy your lunch.